David Ornstein, one of our own as we like to think of. <laughs> I'll give you a prediction on that because I would be making it up. Fabio Vieira, who signed for Arsenal. No one really saw that coming until he was pretty much on a flight over to England to do his medical. Jules Koundé has been a long-term target of Chelsea. I think Tottenham have done okay so far. Ivan Perisic brings great pedigree and experience even at, at that age. Preference of Jed Spence, as I revealed, has been to join Tottenham. Any big ones that got away? Oh. <laughs> Too many to mention. Many, many big ones that got away, yeah. Just run us through one or two of your biggest stories, the ones that have got everyone talking. Yeah, it was interesting that for a long time I didn't get any scoops because you need the contacts and the, um, the courage to actually um, get them over the line and um, they don't grow off trees. So I spent many years trying to get myself in position to do these and the wins were quite minor. The scoops were small, uh, little transfer story here or there. Um, but I was really immensely proud of uh, a story I did in December of 2013 when I was alerted um, to the fact that the Cardiff City owner, Vincent Tan, um, on Cardiff's first ever season in the Premier League that was not going terribly, but it hadn't been a great start and they'd spent quite heavily in the summer ahead of their first Premier League season had written to the manager, Malky Mackay, uh, by email, uh, listing um, a number of grievances, alleging that he had taken money from transfers, that he had misspent the transfer budget, that he had played players in the wrong positions and was guilty of poor selection um, and tactics and um, giving him an ultimatum to resign or I'll sack you. And I was reading through this in absolute shock um, and a bit of excitement at the possibility that I might be able to break it. And I went through due process and actually Cardiff were very good with me and you give right of reply to the person involved, Malky Mackay and his representatives, to Vincent Tan and his uh, people around him at Cardiff. Um, and we managed to get the story out on the BBC that Vincent Tan has told the Cardiff manager, Malky Mackay, resign or I'm going to sack you. And as I said, they were doing okay in their first season and Mackay had brought them up to the Premier League um, and it wasn't known, this tension, at all. And he was a very popular manager with the fans for what he had done. And I just remember there was one Saturday at Anfield when, straight after we broke this story, where uh, the Cardiff fans were up in arms and for minutes on end during the match and at full time, they were singing, Mal uh, don't sack Mackay, Malky Mackay, I just don't think you understand. Um, and it didn't change Vincent Tan's decision. Malky Mackay didn't walk. Vincent Tan decided to sack him. It was a huge story, but unfortunately it didn't quite make the impact I would hope on the BBC because it was the same night that a theatre in London... Um, had a roof collapse. Yeah, I remember that. And so that dominated the BBC, but it was on all the back pages of the newspapers the next day. And I was very proud of that. And I thought, Cardiff are never going to be speaking to me again because I've revealed this story that doesn't reflect well on them. But actually, I then got the opportunity to go out and interview Vincent Tan in Kuala Lumpur um, and was the first person to do a big interview with him. So that was a really good scoop. Um, and goodness me, I'll bring one to the present day. There have been many transfer stories breaking the news that Robin Van Persie was signing from, or had agreed to, the agreement had been struck for him. I think that was about the 24th of August, 2012. I remember it because it was the first time I went on TV at the BBC to deliver a story. Lots like that. Um, um, Arsenal deciding to appoint Unai Emery and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Mesut Ozil's new contract, transfers at other clubs, uh, Aaron Wan-Bissaka to Manchester United are broken. You remember so many things when you come to think of it. Um, uh, the appointment of Ralph Ranić as interim manager at Manchester United. Um, but probably if we bring it to the more recent time, a really high impact one um, that made a real sort of... Um, 
statement within our industry and, and the public was breaking news that Jurgen Klopp had signed a new contract with Liverpool. Our esteemed colleagues like Paul Joyce at the Times, um, I think Dominic King maybe at the Mail, Chris Bascom at the Telegraph who work on the Merseyside pack had um, revealed that morning that Liverpool were under the impression that Jurgen Klopp was now prepared to sign a new contract. It was the morning after they beat Villarreal at Anfield in the Champions League. But a few hours later, I broke the news that he had signed this new contract, a two-year extension. Um, and shortly after, Liverpool announced it. I had a bit of time before they announced it, which was great, because some stories like the Van Persie scoop, um, by the time I had done all my checks and stood it up, I think the clubs got wind yeah. that I was going and they released a statement 10 minutes later. So the exclusivity was short, but with uh, the Cardiff City one and the Jurgen Klopp one, just two examples where you feel, yeah, I got the scoop and then other journalists, um, you know, they credit you more often than not for your work and, and on you go. Brilliant. And, and any big ones that got away? Oh, <laughs> too many to mention. Many, many big ones that got away. Yeah, there was one... Um, that I'll pick out off the top of my head, which was so frustrating because I had a text message that um, Timo Werner was going to be signing for Chelsea. He um, uh, had uh, agreed to the move after Chelsea stepped forward as the only club prepared to pay his release clause. Liverpool had been heavily linked, mm -hmm. but That's right, it didn't work out in the end with that. And Chelsea came forward and, um, and I was tipped off about it on a text message but that's not enough for me you need to make sure you've had phone conversations and stood it up properly and then checked with the relevant club press offices and things and his representatives um and i was trying to call the contact that sent me the text message and he wasn't available uh he must have been in a meeting or something i called and i called and i called and no luck text no luck um and then in the meantime um, the story broke via Germany, Christian Falke, a journalist that I didn't mention earlier, and Matt Law here in the UK, they put it out and I just saw this story explode because he was a bit of a sensation yeah. at the time, Timo Werner for club and country, RB Leipzig in Germany, and he's coming to Chelsea um, and they not long after their transfer ban as well, so they were getting back into signings and he's a big name um, and it just went absolutely off and I was sort of thinking that was my story that I lost and those happen I'm afraid Jerry on a pretty regular yeah, basis well, that's, uh... and, it, and it really hurts but you've got to respond to it very well so I think managed to speak to the contact who said he was in meetings and a few others as well and we built up a story of how the deal came about and the background information and that actually was much more successful than the athletic than just breaking the story mm. it brought real eyeball it brought readers and eyeballs to the website um, to read what really happened behind the scenes and that's why you should never be too downhearted when the liverpool uh, based reporters broke news of Klopp you know, being open to signing a new contract which i knew as well um, and hadn't got out, they were so quick and, and excellent, um, you feel down. But um, you can't stay down and go miserable and stop making phone calls and text messages because you won't get anything. And so I kept on plugging away, even though I was gutted to miss out on both occasions. Um, and in the case of Klopp, I then found out that actually he's signed and they're taking photos at the training ground. And so it can often lead to a bigger Turn story. Turn into a positive. So the misses can actually be the foundation. And... and you know, sometimes the contacts might not have wanted the stuff to come out via you and you see it come out via somebody else and you, you, you want to shout at them like, well, why didn't you let me do that? But there might be sensitivities yeah. around it. Don't get angry at them. Stay calm. They'll respect you more for respecting their wish for you not to bring stuff out. And um, or sometimes you get unlucky and miss it. And there will always be another one. That's the thing. It's not the be all and end all. It's just sport. It's just football in our case, journalism, transfers. It's not life and death. And um it's often swings and roundabouts. What goes around comes around. And if you're doing the right things, when the time is right, you'll get the right outcomes. And more often than not, you'll, well, you'll win. And it gives you a thirst. And that's what makes you disappointed when you don't. But you need to stand back and appreciate that many of us in this industry uh, and so many of my peers who I respect more than you would even believe, I look up to them from the newspapers, websites, broadcasters, radio stations on a daily basis. I'm privileged and honoured to know many of them. I couldn't have greater respect. And um, there's a lot of good examples out there for people to follow. Brilliant. So next, let's just run through 
Um, first of all, let's let's see who's had a good window, who needs to do some business, what you think might happen yet, without going into specific names because we're going to do we we'll do the question and answer bit in a quick far away sure. soon. But just just so far, we're only a couple of weeks into the window, obviously. Um, who's who's done good business in your view so far? Well, Aston Villa started very quickly. They got a slick operation there. The um, hierarchy right the way up from the ownership. They seem to sing from the same hymn sheet. Um, they put their money where their mouth is and they get things executed in a very quick and efficient fashion. So I think they knocked off, was it three signings? Um, pretty much before the window had even opened, I think it was. Um, and that was Bubakar Kamara, um, um, Diego Carlos and Robin Olsen. So I thought Villa started efficiently and that took some of the pressure off of them. I don't think you can look away from the deal that Manchester City struck to bring Erling Haaland in from Borussia Dortmund, courtesy of the release clause that makes him pretty good value for money. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I can't wait to see him in the Premier League. And again, they then will do some more business, but they got their key acquisition in early. I've always got admiration for Liverpool. Um, their transfer committee used to be derided, and now it's the... Well, it's not called that anymore, but their transfer operation is now... Um, the gold standard within the industry and they managed to get Darwin Nunes who a lot of clubs wanted questions about the price tag but uh, it's definitely a good signing and um, they won't need to do a hell of a lot more they've um, and getting Diaz during the season as well was a big point yeah Luis Diaz mid-season was a wonderful signing a very efficient deal Uh, we wrote about how that came about and it was it was fascinating and a, a great example of how to do your business. City, I think Tottenham have done okay so far. Ivan Perisic brings great pedigree and experience. Even at, at that age, it was a bit of a no-brainer. It was a free transfer. Free, yeah. Well, nothing's free, but it was no transfer fee. Um, and they also got in Fraser Forster. Very good experience. Brings some more sort of British core to the, the operation there. Um, and they've made one other Basuma. signing. Bissouma, which is... Uh, Sort of player they've been looking for for a long time, really. Yeah, and, and I think he's a top player. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're looking at doing more business as well. So, yeah, off the top of my head, those so far. But I'm, I'm not ruling out, you know, um, the likes of Arsenal want to do a lot of business. Tottenham want to do more. Uh, Manchester United, let's judge them at the end of the window because it's not gone to plan so far and reserve judgment. Um, Chelsea of, as well. I mean, Chelsea with their new ownership. Newcastle with their relatively new ownership. Um, Everton probably need to do some business sooner rather than later because of their financial situation. So there is tons that we're going to see this summer. It's, it's going to be fascinating. But I'll just pick out maybe a Villa, Manchester City and a Tottenham so far. And can you see one player or, or a couple of players that you think might make us all sit up and watch and take notice that we weren't expecting either to arrive or someone who's been signed that probably a little bit under the radar... Oh, I don't know how it's going to pan out for this player, but the ingredients are good and it was under the radar. So I've, I've fit, you, fitted your criteria there. Fabio Vieira, who signed for Arsenal. And, excuse me, no one really saw that coming until he was pretty much on a flight over to England to do his medical at London Colney. An interesting deal there for what could prove to be a pretty good price. I think £35 million, pounds, €30 million Euros plus £5 million in add-ons or something like that. Um, and he's done very well in a short time at Porto, 22 years old. Creativity, great uh, record for assists in the last couple of years. Um, Portugal has seemed a happy hunting ground for Premier League clubs in recent times. We mentioned Luis Diaz and um, Darwin Nunes f- coming in from... From Portugal, um, you can you know look at some of the business of other clubs. I think Ruben Diaz did fantastic yeah, coming in Bruno from Fernandes, Manchester City. Obviously. Bruno Fernandes. So I'm going to say uh, keep <clears> a lookout for Fabio Vieira at Arsenal. Does he go straight into the team, or is he back up to Odegaard? Or I think I think Arsenal expect him to need a bit of adaptation time because he's quite a slight mm. and. Um, diminutive figure uh, but we've seen some of them do fantastically well in the Premier League but they do need a bit of time to acclimatise just for the likes of David Silva for example Um, so you may need to bulk up and get used to the intensity and physicality Um, but 
you expect that he will be in the mix with Arsenal playing in domestic competitions and the Europa League this season, back in Europe for the first time in a year. So, yeah, I think I'm going to go for him. There's also a really interesting signing at Southampton that I reported the day before we recorded this. Um, now, I can't remember or know exactly how to pronounce his name. Kopchak. Uh, Kot, Kotchak um, is, is the end of his surname. So I do apologise on on the accuracy front, but he's a central defender who comes from Bochum in Germany, 20 years old, um, 10 million euros. Um, people have described him as being or having the potential to be in the Rudiger style mold. Okay. Like a really um, talented central defender who can bring the ball out with his feet, who's a towering presence, is good in the tackle, is aggressive, is a bit of a leader. Um, he comes from Germany, under 21 international, so he speaks good English. And I wonder if it's like a, the next Salisu for Southampton, who's done very well yeah. there. Good scouting operation at Southampton. Do you think Chelsea missed a trick there? Because obviously they're looking for centre backs, aren't they? Yeah, they are, but I think they are looking more towards the elite bracket. And Kunde. Yeah, mm. so they, they've considered names like Kunde. We don't know where that is at the moment. Um, loads of names have floated around Kim Pembe, Skriniar. <laughs> Pretty much every centre-back under the sun, Nathan Ake as a left-sided option. Um, but I think they are going for you know, a Champions League club. They want to be having players who will hit the ground running and can play with that expectation, which a, a, a €10 million Euro signing from Bochum into Southampton might not. But he may well go on to a Chelsea-level player in the way that Virgil van Dijk came from Celtic to Southampton yeah. and then on to Liverpool. So. Southampton have new owners now. Um, and they've got Rasmus Ankerson in there from, from Brentford too. So they're very clearly doing things differently. And it could be a sign of things to come. Only um, the day before we recorded this, I saw Edu at Arsenal talking about the signing of Fabio Vieira. And he said, we are 100% committed to youth and that bracket that they've been signing in. So you're talking um, uh, Aaron Ramsdale last summer. Um, who else did they bring in? Uh, it was a really busy summer for Arsenal in, in that in that age profile. Um, they brought in Tommy Asu from Bologna. They brought in Ben White, um, uh, uh, Sambi Laconga, Nuno Tavares, and blending them with academy talent. So clearly clubs are not stupid. They're seeing that if they're not necessarily at the absolute top level, so we're talking Chelsea, Manchester City, yeah. sorry, Manchester City, Liverpool, with Chelsea just behind at the moment, who are vying for the Premier League title, then they're accepting, actually, perhaps it's better to do it a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. So, let's uh, let's get on to some of these big names. Let's yeah. see if we can get a couple of these going. The preference of Jed Spence, as I revealed, has been to join Tottenham, um, but... That is not a foregone conclusion because they have to agree a fee with Middlesbrough, which hasn't happened yet. And we know Nottingham Forest really likes Spence, having had him on loan for a year as they pro were promoted to the Premier League. Um, and there are various other clubs who have um, expressed well-documented interest in him, likes of Brentford um, and some overseas as well. Um, where things stand now, I think Jed Spence is most uh, Likely destination before the end of the window is Tottenham Hotspur. In terms of Bastoni, he has interest from a number of clubs in the Premier League and beyond. Um, I don't have concrete information on where he's going to end up. I have seen some suggestions coming out of Italy that he's going to be staying at Inter. But he is wanted and um, so it wouldn't surprise you. The fee would be high um, and I'm not going to give you a prediction on that because I would be making it up. Um, if I was to say one, maybe he'll stay at Inter. Jules Koundé to Chelsea? Jules Koundé has been a long-term target of Chelsea. Um, the difficulty there is there's been a changing of ownership in that period. There's even been a changing just this week of executives with Marina Granovskaya, who was leading transfer negotiations previously and would have been at the centre of this pursuit, like most others, um, and now is not involved. Todd Bowley, the new co-owner of Chelsea, is the de facto sporting director on an interim basis. So he will have to make a decision with Chelsea's recruitment department. And I don't know where Chelsea are with Kunde at the minute. There clearly appears to be interest in him from Barcelona as well. 
Um, and it will also depend on what Sevilla want for him because that has been the sticking point in the past and has blocked his move previously. Don't forget that Manchester City in the past almost signed him um, before they ended up bringing in, I think it was Ruben Diaz. Um, so Kunde is one to watch for this summer. A couple more quick ones. If not Lewandowski, who did Chelsea sign to replace Le- Lukaku? Well, I wouldn't rule Chelsea out on Gabriel Jesus. They've got firm interest in him and they need to replace Lukaku. There's been talk of Usman Dembele as well, who I'm sure Thomas Tuchel would like. Um, But Chelsea are now in the process of of trying to find that replacement. Yeah, let's see what happens with Gabriel Jesus and uh, go from there because he is one of their options. And just a couple that might be going out. United, Juan Bissaka, Eric Bailly and Anthony Martial. Aaron Wambasaka's future is in a bit of doubt. Um, it's not clear if he wants to stay at Manchester United or make a move maybe on a, a loan basis with interest from the likes of Crystal Palace and Manchester United potentially open to that, which would see Manchester United, we think, needing a right back if that happens. They presumably wouldn't go with what they have. Eric Bailly, um, I don't have any concrete information on that, but it feels like his time at Manchester United has has run its course. Um and Eric Ten Hag clearly has his own ideas. And then Anthony Martial, the latest report suggests that Manchester United might like to give him another chance in their attack. Um, he, of course, spent uh, part of last season on loan at Sevilla, and there will be a market for him, but will it be at the value that Manchester United want? And if not, maybe you keep him and work with him and try and unlock the potential that we've all seen for so many years. So there we have it. David Ornstein, one of our own, as we like to think, at Haters. Um, He's come good. He's given you some great tips, and he's also given you his insight on some of the big moves that may yet happen this summer. Um, We'd like to come back, if it's all right, David, but towards the end of the window, maybe just after the window closes, or slams shut, as they say in tabloid terms, um, and just maybe maybe look and see if there's been a few surprises, uh, a few hits and misses, I'm sure, as you talked about. Um, But until then... Remember to subscribe to The Athletic if you don't already because it's a fantastic read, not least for David's column. <laughs> um, follow David on social media if you're not already. Don't forget Haters TV. Subscribe to us on every level you can, all our social channels. And just keep following what we're, what we're doing because uh, it's going to be a busy summer. And uh, it's been a pleasure to spend some time with you, David, learn your process and also to, um, to get your insight on how it's gone. No, it's been a pleasure for me to join you. I can't guarantee the weather will be like this when you next come back, but it'd be more than um, more than happy to chat again and, and see that all of the transfer predictions have proved to be misses. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Cheers, Jerry.